denizens of the night. Welcome to another episode of the macabre, the terrifying. Broadcasting live from a leaky boat on a bottomless lake, I will be your guide through the witching hours. Tonight, we'll have ourselves a little double feature. It's been a little while since we had one of those, hasn't it? As our scene fades in, we find ourselves in a still and quiet wood on the banks of an ancient lake. There's something unusual about the smell carried on the wind, and the still waters seem to thrum with an ancient power, and the shoreline drops down into a dark depth which seems to have no bottom. This story is called Don't Go Near the Old Lake, It's Bottomless, and was written by Carla. Beware of the old lake. It's bottomless. The words of the old folks echoed within me. As a child, I had listened to them. I was absolutely terrified of the little lake, which lay like a pitch-black clearing in the middle of the forest. I was afraid of the lake's edges, surrounded by sharp, thick reeds. I was afraid of the dense trees around the lake, and the heavy branches that stretched their arms down over the murky water. My stomach ached in the winters when my schoolmates ventured out to ice skate on the frozen water, especially as the ice only got darker the closer you got to the center of the lake. When I returned to my hometown a few years ago, after several years abroad, it took a long time before I wanted to approach the lake again. But as the years went by, it became easier to go near it, as I grew older and became more calm and rational, and as my interest in fishing grew. It was very rare for anyone to venture out on the lake, and the fishing was relatively good. Mostly, I caught perch and bream in my nets, but on a few occasions, I caught pike. It was also said that there were eels in the lake, but I never saw any signs of them. My grandfather and his drinking buddies had called it the old lake. In hindsight, I thought that was strange. Aren't all lakes old? And this idea that it would be bottomless, that was just something people said when they didn't have the facts. Nothing could be bottomless. Somewhere down there, there was a lake bed. It's as simple as that. In other words, I felt relatively calm when I decided to row out on that November day. I had had a gnarly week at work, and now I looked forward to letting a relaxing afternoon of fishing dissolve my stress knots and budding ulcers. I had decided to, as my grandfather used to call it, fun fish. That means going out on the lake in a boat and to fish with nothing but a regular fishing rod. Just a float, a sinker, and a hook. Nothing special like lures or even a bait. This strategy is perfect for those who don't want to catch any fish. I just wanted to sit there for a few hours and watch the float bob up and down. Maybe have a couple of beers in the boat and then walk the two miles to my cabin with a relaxed mind. No fish to clean or cook, no hassle. On the other hand, there would be no gourmet dinner for my cat Milton, but he would have to bear it. The mist lay like a blanket over the forest. Rainwater still dripped from the needles and leaves onto the moss below, creating a symphony of wet thuds. A slight chill seemed to approach me with the gentle breeze, and with that wind came the musty smell of the lake. I've never had anything against that smell, but after the rainy night and morning, it had intensified even further. 
It was the smell of almost stagnant water, of living and dead plants, of age and darkness. At that moment, I had a thought of turning back. No fishing, just sit down in my armchair with Milton in my lap, pour myself a glass of wine, perhaps watch a movie. Maybe it was stubbornness that led me closer to the lake, where I walked with my fishing rod in hand. Stubbornness and the idea that some old superstition certainly wouldn't change my plans. The forest was silent. No birds or animals could be heard, hardly even a gust of wind. Apart from my creaking rubber boots, the stillness was overwhelming. It was as if the air trembled with soundlessness. And then it lay before me, like a soft black floor in the middle of the forest, where the pale gray sky sent streaks of silver across the surface. The old lake. The smell became even more distinct to me, much stronger than I'd ever felt it before, as if it penetrated my nostrils. But it wasn't just the moisture and the smell that affected me. It was something else. Something ancient. Waiting. The feeling of being watched grew stronger the closer I came to the water, and once again the desire to turn back took hold of me. But I continued, and soon I stood at the water's edge. The lake even looked larger now as it spread out. I untied the knot that secured my grandfather's old rowboat, and with a light push I set it into the water. I accidentally stepped wrong, and I felt cold water close around my boot-clad foot. It might have been pure imagination, but I also thought I felt something else in the water. A pulse? Like heartbeats coming from deep below the surface. I decided to ignore the feeling and continue. A few seconds later, I was in the boat, and a few light strokes later, the rowboat glided out onto the lake. As soon as the float hit the smooth water, I felt a calmness settle over me. The anxiety I had felt on the path down to the lake was gone, and my gaze fixated on the float, and I entered the meditative state that had drawn troubled souls to fishing for millennia. Hours passed. The three beers I had packed in my backpack were consumed slowly, and with each sip I sank deeper into the calmness and relaxation that I now felt my body so strongly yearned for. Just as planned, I didn't catch any fish at all, but after three hours, my body began to protest the uncomfortable sitting position, and at the same time I slurped down the last drops of beer. I was about to pull up the float when I felt it. A tug on my fishing rod, a tug from below, from the lake. My initial reaction was joy, that reflexive joy all fishermen feel when they've caught something. But quickly, that reaction was replaced by unease. I had been sitting there for hours without seeing even a ripple on the water, without hearing any splashing from the reeds, no signs of life. Moreover, as I mentioned earlier, I had no bait on the hook, and whatever had bitten down there was big. Too big to swim so close to the surface. Too big to be fooled by a naked hook. But it wasn't just that something was weighing down the float in the line. Now, the feeling I had when I'd stepped into the cold water returned. It felt like my fishing rod was trembling. Not visibly, but I could swear I felt faint pulses from the rod. A profound fear seized me, but out of sheer old habit I began to pull the rod upward. I met resistance. Whatever had bitten the hook was fighting back. 
The thought of just letting go of the rod and sacrificing it to the lake crossed my mind, of course. But pride and curiosity took over, and I continued my struggle with whatever was now under the water. Finally, I saw the surface start to ripple, and I could see something dark and shiny below the water. A second later, the fish slapped its tail, creating a dull splash, for it was clear that it was a fish, a perch even. A wave of relief washed over me, and I chuckled a bit as I thought about how scared and irrational I had just been. I was still surprised that I'd caught it with a baitless hook, but stranger things have happened. With one final tug, the fish left the water, and I lifted it into the boat with ease. However, it was at this moment that the smile faded from my lips, and the feeling of relief was extinguished, because what lay before me was perhaps a fish, but definitely not a common perch. The creature wriggling in front of me was quite large, maybe ten inches long and reasonably chubby, but its color was unlike anything I had ever seen. It was pitch black. Not the dark green that often transitions to black, as in most perch, but completely black, like the scales of a snake. Moreover, the fish's eyes were abnormally large, disproportionate to its body, and its black pupils were surrounded by a pale, bloodshot white. In a panic, the black pupils moved around in the eyeball, as if my catch was searching for something with its gaze. Its mouth was also black, and behind the open lips I could see sharp, ivory-white teeth, much larger than anything I'd seen on such a small fish before. I'm not sure what I was thinking. I should have thrown it back into the water. But instead... I grabbed one of the oars and gave the fish a good blow to the head with the end of the shaft. Its tail stopped flapping, and I leaned back in the boat. Now I noticed how tired I was and how empty my mind was after the struggle with the fish. I had probably also become a little tipsy after those three beers. Without really thinking about what I was doing, I started rowing back to the reedy shore. The black fish lay beside me, with its bloodshot eyes seemingly staring up at the gray, darkening sky. I noticed how I repeatedly glanced down at it, finding it difficult to tear my gaze away, and a few times I had to adjust my course, because in my absent-mindedness I was rowing in the wrong direction. An uneasy feeling filled me, like when you lie awake at night and can't sleep because you're thinking about a sad memory or lost love. Why didn't I just throw the fish overboard? I can't explain it. Why didn't I just get in the car and drive to town, book a room at the small hotel and spend the rest of the evening eating junk food and watching TV? Why did I put that fish in a bucket and take it back to the cabin? Why did I bring it into the house? The sight of it, lying there on the kitchen table with an old newspaper beneath it, made me feel sick. It seemed larger now than it had in the boat. Perhaps it was the yellow light from the kitchen lamp but the fish also appeared even blacker, as if it radiated pure darkness. Was it really dead? I sat down in the kitchen chair. Outside, the autumn darkness had settled like a wet blanket over the cabin. I cautiously picked up the knife I had laid out earlier. The fish was in front of me, black, with giant bloodshot eyes, with its small pupils gazing upward. I placed my hand on it. The fish was ice cold. My hand trembled as the blade approached the fish's tail. 
Why would I even bother gutting it? There was no way I would want to eat it. The moment the blade touched the fish, I saw something out of the corner of my eye outside the window. My entire body jerked, and I looked outside. It was dark out, really dark. The first thing I saw was just my own pale face reflected in the window. I saw myself sitting there with the knife and my hand on the black fish. But after a couple of seconds, my eyes adjusted and I could see out into the autumn night. And far off, down by the lake, I saw something that made my heart skip a beat. A light? Not the light of a lantern or a flashlight. This was something else. It was a small, round light, blue, cold, and perfectly still. I turned to check if there might be something in the cabin causing a light reflection on the window when my gaze immediately snapped back to the fish. Fear had now truly taken hold of me. I could swear that for a millisecond the fish's small pupils were directed at me while the sharp white teeth were exposed behind its open mouth. It must have been my imagination, right? Was it the cabin's light playing tricks on me? I shivered all over. I didn't dare turn my back on the fish again, so I took a few steps back and looked outside once more. There was no doubt about it. There was a flickering little blue light somewhere out there. I stared at the light. I don't know for how long. Then I understood everything. For the first time in several hours, I felt completely calm, and a soft smile spread across my tired face. I walked over to the kitchen table and placed my hand on the fish once more. It wasn't cold anymore. I saw the pupil twitch, and my smile grew wider. I lifted it up and headed out the cabin door, not even bothering to close it. It didn't matter anymore. My cat, Milton, bolted out of the door and ran into the forest, as if he was trying to get as far away from the lake as he could. He knew. With determined steps, humming an unknown tune, I walked barefoot on the wet gravel road and onto the path leading down to the lake. Far in front of me, that cold blue light was still visible. Everything was so clear to me now. The fish now felt almost warm in my hand, and I could feel it making gentle, small twitches that traveled up my arm. Even though it was pitch black in the spruce forest, I could almost see and feel those large eyes staring at me. My bare feet sank into the moss as I took step after step closer to the light, and eventually I could see the lake in front of me, silent and dark. In the middle of the lake, just below the surface, I could see the faint blue light. The rowboat was there, but I didn't care about it. Instead, I held the fish tightly and stepped into the cold water. Slowly, I began to wade in. The smell from below, the damp and musty odor, reached my nostrils. Beware of the old lake. It's bottomless. The words echoed within me. As the bottom disappeared beneath my feet and I started swimming, and the fish, still in my grasp, became even more restless. Almost there, I whispered, and a trickle of murky lake water entered my mouth, making me cough. The light came closer and closer. Soon, 
I was right above it. I was filled with warmth and calmness. I let go of the fish, and it quickly disappeared beneath me. And then came the moment I had been waiting for. Long, cold, slimy fingers gently gripped my ankle. The grip wasn't tight or violent, but more like a caress, an icy caress, that effortlessly and without resistance slowly pulled me downward. The last thing I saw was the dark November sky. The last thing I felt was the bottomless lake enveloping me and the ancient water filling my lungs. Well, that was positively Lovecraftian, wasn't it? You know, most of the monsters we hear about on this show are more, uh, human-sized, shall we say. But I absolutely love imagining a malevolence on a more cosmic scale, don't you? Imagine yourself in a boat out on the ocean, where the ocean floor lies miles beneath you. Slowly, a hulking shape begins to break up through the water, and as it rises hundreds, then thousands of feet into the air, you realize that whatever is emerging isn't actually floating, it's standing up. This story gives me the same sort of feeling. An ancient and unfathomable evil waits in the depths of a bottomless lake bed. Oh, I love it. If you enjoyed this... Oh, but wait, there's more. Yes, let's enjoy another tale, shall we? Let us turn our gaze now to two young Swedish boys who are having the road trip of their lives before they return home and begin college. Their journey takes them down to the deep American South, more specifically, to a crossroads. And I don't mean a metaphorical crossroads. I mean a literal crossroads. And we all know what sorts of things you can find there, don't we? This story is called My Best Friend's Medication is About to Run Out, and it really scares me, and was also written by Carla. The summer after I graduated, my best friend Linus and I decided to bid a definitive farewell to our childhood with a trip to the U.S. It was something we had talked about for a long time and had saved up money for. A fairly generous contribution from my parents, who thought it would be good for us to get out and see the world, also helped us along. After a few days of partying and sightseeing in New York, we continued our journey into the country. By the time we got to Nashville, we were tired of hitchhiking with shady truck drivers and rickety greyhound buses, so we decided to buy a car. Back then, it was fairly easy to buy an old, half-broken car for a dime, and in the end, we chose a 1961 Ford Ranchero. Blue, ugly as hell and ready to fall apart at any moment. We loved it. The feeling of freedom was immense as we drove along the southern roads, switching between country music stations and feeling the summer air rushing through the old Ford. After a wild weekend partying in Memphis, we slowly realized that both time and money were running out, I was supposed to start my job at my dad's company in a few weeks, and Linus was due to start at a retirement home around the same time. 
we looked at a map and decided to make one last trip with a ranchero, heading down to New Orleans to experience the magic of Bourbon Street before heading home. Getting out of Memphis proved more difficult than expected. The traffic jams made us both impatient and irritable, and sometime in the afternoon, we decided to take a detour southward, Highway 49. Although it turned out to be a good decision in terms of traffic, it didn't take long before darkness enveloped the car. Rain clouds hung heavy, and a stifling, electric-charged air silenced us as a headache crept in. Eventually, neither of us wanted to drive any more, so we pulled off at a motel north of the town of Clarksdale, Mississippi. The pleasure of taking off our sweaty clothes, jumping into the shower, and then pouring a bourbon while the thunderstorm raged outside was very comforting. Linus and I sat on separate beds in the motel room, American TV playing in the background, a bottle between us, talking away for hours. And I still remember it as one of the most beautiful nights of my life. After a few hours, the rain had eased and the clouds had cleared. We were both quite tipsy and felt a walk would do us good. The moon hung gigantic over the hills and woods of Mississippi, and its blue-white light gave a mystical yet secure feeling as we walked in the middle of the night. By midnight, we reached a major crossroads and decided it was a good place to turn back. The night had turned chilly, and our legs weren't as spry as we'd hoped. About a hundred feet before the crossroads was a large information sign. The always curious Linus stopped to read while I took a moment to relieve myself a bit away. When I returned, Linus looked at me with wide eyes. Do you know what this crossroads is? He asked, barely containing his excitement. No, I replied. Isn't it just a regular crossroads? This is where Robert Johnson sold his soul to the devil, Linus said, looking at the board once more. A while later, Linus, who was very interested in music, had told me all he knew about blues icon Robert Johnson, who was said to have sold his soul to the devil right here at the crossroads north of Clarksdale. In exchange, Johnson was said to have been granted the gift to play guitar like a master. Johnson had become one of the real legends in music, even long after his death. Robert Johnson died at the age of 27 in 1938, probably from syphilis. Before I could react, Linus had left my side and was now running towards the crossroads. His long legs marched over the summer-burned grass. In the moonlight, his figure looked almost dreamlike. The darkness laid heavy on the landscape, and it was impossible to see more than a few yards into the void. I constantly felt that we were being watched, that something was out there. I didn't want to stay. I just wanted to go back to the motel and sleep. The story of the Devil's Crossroads had made me uneasy. I've always been quite timid, especially afraid of ghost stories. Still, I followed my best friend. When I arrived, Linus stood in the middle of the crossroads, arms outstretched, and gaze turned upward. Come on! he shouted, as if he saw something far above. Stop it! It's not funny! I tried, but Linus continued. I sell my soul! If only we can be best friends forever! If I can be his best friend forever, you have my soul! He laughed at his prank and twirled around, looking up. Linus was in excellent spirits when we returned to the motel and insisted that we sit down in the bar of the roadhouse next door. We still had enough money to cover gas to New Orleans, plane tickets home, and a bit extra, so I figured it wouldn't hurt if we spent a few bucks on drinks. I was still a bit shaken from the event at the crossroads. 
We played pool, talked to strangers. When Linus went outside to smoke with an older woman he had met, I noticed a man at the bar that I hadn't seen all night. It was strange, as it was a small bar, and the same 10 or 15 people had been there the whole evening. But I couldn't remember seeing this man before. What really struck me was that he was staring right at me. There was no doubt about it. He wore a black suit, a white shirt with a blood-red tie, long, black, slicked-back hair, and a well-groomed beard that framed his pale face. But it was his eyes that really stood out. Deep, cold, black eyes staring straight at me. I tried to acknowledge him with a quick nod. The man smiled, got up, and approached me. I hope you know what you're getting into, the man said in a deep, almost trembling bass voice in perfect Swedish. I was taken aback by his words and couldn't utter a syllable. The man smiled again, reached into his jacket pocket, and took out a white pill bottle without a label. It rattled as he shook it demonstratively. He'll need these, the man said, handing me the bottle. I took it without saying anything, as if all my critical thinking had been blown away. Accepting a bottle of pills from a stranger in the middle of the American countryside wasn't exactly what I'd planned for the evening. I looked down at the bottle, opened it, and saw that it was filled with small red pills. Hundreds of them. When I looked up again, the bar counter was empty. The man had disappeared. The rest of the trip went smoothly. We had an unforgettable weekend in New Orleans, sold the ranchero for a few hundred dollars, and a few days later, we were back in Sweden. So, why am I telling you this? Well, I've started having serious problems. Twenty-five years have gone by since that summer in the U.S., and Linus is very ill. I didn't fully realize how bad his condition was until today. The day started like most others. I woke up, had breakfast, kissed my children and wife goodbye, and drove to work. As usual, I handed over the car keys to Edward, who was waiting outside the building and greeted me. I entered, said hi to the staff, and took the elevator to the 18th floor, where I have my favorite office. The morning went well. We planned a consulting trip to Dubai. I had a successful meeting with an investor for a new project, and then I had a nice lunch with a finance minister at a pretty decent restaurant in downtown Stockholm. It was on my way back to the office when a notification on my mobile phone alerted me. Linus's medication was all the note from my calendar app said. I sighed, having forgotten that it was today. Perhaps I should clarify a few things, since I haven't been completely honest in this story. Or, more accurately, I've omitted a few details. Firstly, I should mention that I've been very successful in life. Shortly after returning home, I got a job at my father's company, and when he passed away a few years later, I took over his stock portfolio, including majority shares in all the companies. I made successful investments in factories in China, India, and South Africa, and made profitable placements in real estate and commodities. Call me old-fashioned, but I firmly believe that one has to put in the effort to get anywhere in this world, and that every man is the master of his own destiny. I've worked hard and made my way up on my own, and I deserve what I've achieved. But none of that matters now that my best friend is ill. Seriously ill. He's like a brother to me. My family. When I returned from lunch, I went up to my office, unlocked my safe, and took out Linus's medicine bottle. There were only a couple of red pills left. I went back out to the elevator, 
used my special access card, and pressed the button for basement two. When the elevator door is opened, I was greeted by Dr. Vidstrom, who always had a smile on her face. She doesn't know the severity of the situation. She knows she can't truly help Linus, but she gets paid to do her best. I walked through the corridor, past nurses and doctors nodding their greetings, down to the large glass doors at the end, the glass doors to Linus's room. I then remembered the man with the black hair and beard. You see, I haven't told you everything he said to me that evening. When he handed me the pill bottle, he said in his clear, fluent Swedish, He will need these. Give him one a month. I will grant your wish. As long as he lives, you will have what you desire. When he dies, his soul is mine, and our deal is over. I approached the glass doors, saw doctors moving back and forth inside. I entered. The room smelled of hand sanitizer and death. Then I saw the bed. I saw Linus. He had lost even more weight since I last saw him. His pale skin taut over protruding bones, his face hollow and chalk white around his enormous eyes. Tubes were inserted into his thin blue veins. IV bags surrounded his bed. His mouth was open, revealing the few teeth he had left. His gaze met mine, and his lips formed a smile. I approached, genuinely moved by his reaction. He had been sick and weak for a long time, but now my best friend looked like a corpse. With jerky movements, his chest rose and fell. I placed my hand on his cold, thin arm. My friend, he whispered. Linus, please, don't try to speak. You're weak. He shook his head. You're my best friend. You take such good care of me. I'm so happy. You're my best friend in the whole world. Seeing him in that state made me sick, and I remembered the night at the crossroads when the young, healthy, and strong Linus exclaimed, I'll sell my soul just so we can be best friends forever. If I can be his best friend forever, you can have my soul. And I remembered how I had whispered, Take his soul. Take it and give me everything I desire in return. While Linus laughed and twirled around. I remembered the blue moonlight, the cool summer night in Mississippi so long ago. Two pills left. That's two months. Then Linus will die. He's so weak, as if something is draining life from him. And what happens when he's gone? Will I also pass away? Will my life continue as before? What about my investments, my stock portfolio? I'm genuinely concerned. I don't want anything to change. If you, the reader of this, have any advice for me on how to prepare, please let me know. I might share some of my success with you. All the best, Nicholas. Oh, man! Double timed at the crossroads! Well, friend... You know how the saying goes. You sow the wind, you reap the whirlwind. Or maybe I should say, you've got to give the devil his due. <laughs> if you enjoyed these stories, please check out the author in the links below. 
please also leave a like on this video and subscribe for more stories like this one. Whatever you do, trust your gut and don't sell your friend's soul and don't fall asleep. <laughs>